Internet. What's your home address? Where are you from? Uh, 14155 South Beaver Creek Road, number 201. The same as Ashley Pond. And what's your daughter's name? Miranda Gaddis, G-A-D-D-I-S. And no one's talked to her or seen her. The case of 12-year-old Ashley Pond, who vanished while on her way to the school bus, triggered a thorough investigation. Among those interviewed by reporters was a girl who was not only Ashley's close friend, but also tragically destined to meet a similar fate. Today, we delve into this perplexing case. From the girl's mysterious disappearance to the tireless efforts of the investigation team and the chilling discovery of their whereabouts. We will also witness a brave woman who raised her children on her own, her spine-chilling night, and the perpetrator who was caught 40 years later. Brace yourselves. We're stepping into the crime scene now. We're heading towards Oregon City, a charming place in the state that shares its name, with a population of about 30,000. Our story kicks off on a January morning back in 2002 when 12-year-old Ashley Pond overslept, which made her miss the school bus. In a hurry to say a quick goodbye to her mom, Lori, she dashed out without grabbing breakfast, eager to make it to her dance class. Little did she know that she would end up missing both school and her beloved dance lesson that day. As hours passed with no sign of Ashley after her dance class, Lori's worry grew. She contacted the school and the dance studio, only to find out that Ashley hadn't been to either place, nor had she boarded the bus. Fearing the worst, Lori reached out to all of Ashley's friends, hoping she might be with one of them, but no luck. With no other option, she decided to call 911 to report Ashley missing. The local police in Oregon City acted quickly, arriving at Lori's home promptly to start the search. Initially, there was speculation that Ashley might have run away and would come back, but as time went on, it became clear that wasn't the case. Rumors started circulating in town about Ashley possibly running off. Her family sprang into action, spreading missing person flyers everywhere, doing everything they could to find her, while the authorities worked hard to piece together a timeline of events. Interviews were carried out with children on the bus to retrace Ashley's steps, but none of them could confirm her getting off at her usual stop. Her bus stop was located behind her house, on a hill near a wooded area that kids often used as a shortcut. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, detectives mentioned they were considering abduction as a possible scenario, focusing on those closest to Ashley. Lori, who became a mother at just 16, found herself in a distressing situation. After Ashley, another sibling came along. Ashley, known for her kind and protective nature, was a lively young girl who enjoyed captivating others with her vibrant personality. Her early years were relatively peaceful, but things took a turn when her parents separated when she was nine, which had a lasting impact on her young life. However, more turmoil awaited. A long-held family secret came to light when Ashley found out through a paternity test that David, the man she thought was her father, was not her biological parent. Wesley Rotger came forward as her biological father, a fact that Ashley welcomed, eager to build a bond with him. She valued the weekend visits to Wesley's home as a chance to make up for lost time, but sadly, those visits came to an abrupt halt. One day, confiding in her mother, Ashley revealed her unease around Wesley, accusing him of serious wrongdoing. It emerged that Wesley had been physically abusive towards Ashley and her sibling, a truth that they bravely reported to the authorities. In early 2001, Wesley was accused of molesting his daughter, Ashley, 40 times. His lawyer argued that Ashley, who was a troubled teenager, had fabricated the accusations. Eventually, under pressure, Ashley recanted her testimony against her father, which significantly damaged her credibility. Consequently, Wesley Rotger received only six months of probation and suspension. 
Lori, Ashley's mother, suspected Wesley's involvement in her daughter's disappearance and promptly alerted the authorities about the past events. Investigators visited Wesley at his residence in Portland to question him about the disappearance. To their surprise, he confessed to the past molestations, attributing them to his struggles with drug addiction. Expressing remorse, he acknowledged the consequences and expressed hope for future reconciliation with his daughter. Wesley maintained his innocence regarding the disappearance, supported by a solid alibi that was verified. Consequently, the detectives redirected their focus towards Lori Pond, Ashley's mother. Lori, who had previously faced accusations of child neglect and dealt with alcoholism like Wesley, had a rocky relationship with her daughter. Back in 2001, authorities had contacted her multiple times due to neglect complaints. School staff also brought up Ashley's allegation of molestation by a friend's father, which Lori did not pursue further, nor did the police investigate it. During questioning, Lori openly described her conflicts with Ashley but emphasized their deep bond of love. She agreed to undergo a polygraph test, which she successfully passed. As the investigation unfolded, the police delved into registered sex offenders in the area, but came up empty. Shortly after Ashley's disappearance, a reporter interviewed children at the bus stop where she was last seen. Among them was Miranda Gaddis, Ashley's close friend and neighbor. Like Ashley, Miranda had a history of abuse from their fathers and was raised by their mothers. Their lives intertwined through school, dance teams, and mutual friends. During the interview, Miranda expressed shock and sorrow over Ashley's disappearance. Little did she know, she would soon vanish mysteriously, becoming part of the ongoing investigation. On March 23rd, 2002, Gardner Middle School was getting ready for a dance show that would also serve as a fundraiser for Ashley's search efforts. Miranda was ready to participate in the event. It was just an ordinary day in Oregon City on March 8, 2002. Miranda's mom, Michelle, went off to work while her daughter got ready for school. Later that day, Michelle received a call informing her that Miranda hadn't shown up for school and none of her friends had seen her. Without hesitation, Michelle reported her daughter missing, triggering a frantic search. And what's your home address where she's missing from? Uh, 14155 South Beaver Creek Road, number 201. The same as Ashley Pond. And what's your daughter's name? Miranda Gaddis, G-A-D-D-I-S. And no one's talked to her or seen her. The Oregon City Police and locals couldn't ignore the chilling similarities between Miranda's and Ashley's disappearances, causing fear to spread through the community. Families were scared to let their children out alone, concerned about a possible predator targeting young girls in the area. Police announced a suspected connection between the two missing girls. Intensive investigations focused on the neighborhood, with traffic stops, and interviews with residents becoming routine. Suspicions eventually settled on a house owned by Ward Weaver, located above the bus stop where Ashley and Miranda were last seen. Ward resided there with his girlfriend, his 12-year-old daughter Mallory, and his 19-year-old son Francis for five years. Mallory, a popular student at Gardner School, often had friends over at their house with its large yard where kids liked to hang out. Ashley spent nights there as well. When questioned, Ward cooperated, mentioning that Miranda and Ashley had visited before, but claimed he hadn't seen them on the days they disappeared. He portrayed Ashley as troubled, hinting that she might have had reasons to run away, but he denied any knowledge about Miranda. Detectives asked to search his property, which Ward permitted, but no evidence was found. After exhausting local leads, Detectives turned their focus to Adam and Scott, two men in their 20s, known for making inappropriate comments to young girls, leading to a tarnished reputation in the community. They had previously made unsettling remarks about Ashley and Miranda, raising suspicions about their involvement. They even attended a prayer meeting for the missing girls, a move viewed by detectives as a potential distraction tactic. 
A surveillance team was appointed to monitor Adam and Scott, resulting in their quick arrest while trying to entice a woman into their vehicle. Both men passed a lie detector test, and despite thorough questioning and home searches, no evidence connecting them to the missing girls was found. Just as the investigation seemed to come to a standstill, a significant revelation emerged unexpectedly. Before she went missing, Ashley had accused Ward Weaver of molesting her, which led her to avoid visiting his home. While her friends, including Ward's daughter Mallory, dismissed this claim, Miranda believed it. Detectives also uncovered that Miranda had cautioned her friends against going to Ward's house in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. Further investigation revealed Ward's support for Ashley's father, Wesley, during his trial, where he refuted all allegations against him and portrayed Ashley as untruthful. In May 2002, Ward Weaver was asked by the Oregon Police Department to undergo a polygraph test. As expected, he failed the test, although the results couldn't be used against him in court. Fast forward to July 3, 2002. Ward shocked everyone by inviting the media to his home, claiming he was unfairly targeted and wanting to prove his innocence during the interview. However, when a reporter questioned him about the failed polygraph test, Ward shifted the blame onto the police, declaring he would no longer cooperate with them. Then, on August 13, 2002, a woman contacted the Oregon Police Department with disturbing news. She recounted how Ward had assaulted her, but she managed to flee to a nearby store. Upon reaching Ward's residence, the police discovered he had already fled, sparking a nationwide manhunt. Ward Weaver was apprehended later that day, and a search warrant was obtained for his home. August 13th. Weaver is arrested and charged with raping his son's 19-year-old girlfriend. During the search, cadaver dogs in the backyard alerted the officers to a foul odor, leading them to a shed filled with dead flies. Inside a cardboard box emitting the stench, they found decomposed human remains. Subsequent investigation confirmed these remains belonged to Miranda Gaddis. The search expanded to include a suspicious concrete slab in the backyard the same one Ward had stood on during his interview. Digging beneath the slab revealed three large barrels containing frozen human remains, later identified as those of Ashley Pond. Despite Ward Weaver's persistent denials of any involvement, he was already in custody when formally charged with the aggravated murders of Ashley and Miranda. And that would be the same thing. What would you say to Ashley or Miranda if you had a chance to talk to them? Come home. You know? On September 22, 2004, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Before we dive into our next story, if you could take a moment to hit that like button, it would mean the world to us. A single click for you is a huge boost of encouragement for us. Linda Patterson Slayton was born in Arkansas on March 8, 1950. When she was 16, she became a mother for the first time to Jeffrey, and three years later, Timothy was born. Linda then married the boy's father, Frank Slayton. However, things took a dark turn as Frank's abusive behavior surfaced, plunging Linda and her children into a nightmare. Coping with Frank's issues related to alcohol and drugs, his violent outbursts became a grim routine, making life at home unbearable. Despite the challenges, Linda stuck around for her boys until she reached a breaking point and filed for divorce in 1974. Starting afresh, Linda put her heart and soul into providing for her sons. Tragedy struck on September 4, 1981, when Linda was tragically found dead in her bedroom by her sister, Judy. She had been strangled with hanger and showed signs of a possible assault shaking the community with her untimely death. The investigation took a turn when a mysterious palm print, unrelated to Linda, was discovered at the crime scene. Initially, suspicions naturally fell on Linda's ex-husband, Frank, given his violent history. However, attention shifted to Linda's son, Jeff, 
after a heated argument before her death. Both Jeff and Timothy underwent scrutiny but were cleared of suspicion after passing polygraph tests. As time passed with no new leads, the case eventually went cold, leaving Linda's murder as a haunting, unsolved mystery. After the tragic murder of Linda, her children had to face a new reality without their mother. Thankfully, their grandparents stepped in to care for them as they navigated through life. Over time, they started their own families, tied the knot, and had children of their own. However, they always held their mother's memory close to their hearts and stayed in touch with the detectives investigating her case. Seventeen years had passed since Linda's passing, and the police were still tirelessly seeking justice. With the original detective retired, the baton was passed to a new team led by Detective Brad Grace. After analyzing the unidentified DNA found among the evidence, Brad sent it to the state lab for testing. The Florida Crime Lab successfully generated a DNA profile of Linda Slayton's killer, prompting a fresh review of the suspect list. It was decided to gather DNA samples again from all previous suspects in the hope of finding a match that would lead to the culprit. Jeff was cleared, shifting attention to Frank Slayton. Despite concealing his aggressive and abusive behavior over the years, occasionally reconnecting with his sons, Frank agreed to provide a DNA sample. Unfortunately, it did not match, prompting the need for further investigation. In 2005, Detective Brad submitted the unidentified DNA profile to the FBI's National DNA Database with hopes of a breakthrough. Upon his retirement in 2015, the case was passed to a new detective team, Tammy and Russell. Recognizing the potential of genetic genealogy, they sought the expertise of Cece Moore, a renowned genetic genealogist. Cece meticulously analyzed the DNA sample creating a network of individuals who shared DNA, using genetic and social media data to construct the family tree of the unknown assailant. Their persistent efforts eventually led them to Joseph Clinton Mills, who intriguingly turned out to be Tim's former football coach. Upon delving into Joseph Mills's background, Tammy and Russell uncovered a series of crimes he had been involved in, including a scheme where he orchestrated a robbery through a falsified will though he had never been formally charged for this offense. In 1981, palm prints found in Linda's home were a perfect match to Joseph Mills, but authorities needed solid evidence. Without Joseph's knowledge, they discreetly collected his DNA from trash bags outside his home. Two weeks later, lab results confirmed that Joseph's DNA matched the one found at the crime scene. In December 2019, detectives arrested Joseph Mills for questioning. At the time of the 1981 crime, Joseph was 20 years old. The police had briefly spoken to him shortly after the murder over the phone. During the interview, Joseph claimed he had been at football practice on September 3rd and had also dropped off Tim at his house the night before the murder. He falsely asserted that Linda had invited him over for consensual relations. On the night of September 3rd, 1981, after dropping Tim off from football practice, Joseph returned to ensure the house was empty. He forcibly opened Linda's bedroom window, hid in the closet, and then attacked and strangled her with a hanger. Joseph Mills eventually confessed to first-degree murder and sexual assault charges, portraying himself as a good person in court. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole awaiting his fate. For years, Joseph Mills was a source of pride for Tim Slayton, but a football photo from 1981 now disgusts him. In the picture, the man he once admired and trusted stands right behind him, the same man who murdered his mother. Before we conclude this video, please be aware that the video on the left may be disturbing. It is recommended for adult viewing only. On the right, you'll find a playlist of videos that have been highly appreciated by our viewers.